spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E.G. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs and Beachside Roofing. Great to be with you on this Aloha Friday. I'm Yanji Denise, joined by Ryan Kalei Suji. This is Spotlight Hawaii on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. And Ryan, today we are diving into the world of sports and heading over to UH Manoa. That's right. We'll be bringing in somebody who has actually been a part of this program. We had an opportunity to speak with him during the pandemic of the impact COVID-19 has had on the athletics department at the University of Hawaii. It has been uh, quite a crazy month for the athletic director there, and we're going to catch up with him right now, bringing into the conversation David Matlin, joining us from the lower campus there at UH Manoa. Thanks so much for joining us, David. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Aloha, Yanji and Ryan. You know, there's a lot that we want to get through uh, talking about the future of athletics and, and uh, you know, the different success programs that are happening right now. Uh, but of course, want to talk about football and where we're at right now. Of course, it's been about a week since that official press conference was held at the Simplify Arena at Stan Sheriff Center announcing Timmy Chang. But he's been in this role for a few weeks now. Talk to us about how uh, the coach is doing uh, settling into this new role. You know, um, boy, uh, boy, he, he's hit the ground running. I, I what, what I'm impressed with about him is that, um, you know, he's 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 already he's reaching out. You know, obviously, we've had some challenges. And I think he's doing a great job reaching out, especially with our alumni. And, and even you look at his decisiveness in hiring a great coaching staff that he started off with. He's a few coaches left. Um, you know, I just think reaching out to constituents. What amazes me about him is um, what surprises me. You know, he's got six children, you know, so. And to have the energy he has, it means that he's obviously got an incredible support system. And his wife, Sherry, is, is really amazing. But he's off to a great start. I mean, he's obviously a, a, a local, you know, local grown talent. And, um, you know, excited to be working with him. And the staff is fired up to support him, too. I want to ask you, when that initial offer was made to June Jones, the idea was that he would coach for two years and Timmy would serve, Coach Chang would serve as his assistant, sort of to transition and grow him into that role. Um, do you think that he's ready to take on that role without that kind of training that initially was part of that idea, that sort of succession plan? Yeah, oh, he's he's ready. Like I said, it's become evident, you know, it became evident during the interview process that he was ready and he's the person we need at the helm. But he is a first time head coach and he's going to have to benefit from the advice and guidance of others who have walked in those shoes before him. And, and Timmy's a smart guy, you know, I, I, and I know he's going to need a lot of a lot of help and support. Uh, and that was part of the transition plan. But uh, you, he can get that from a lot of people. Uh, like I said, he's put together a solid staff that will pay dividends for the program, which proves that he's ready. I mean, he, all the people he told me that he, he was planning on bringing on, he's been able to get them on board. Uh, you know, bringing June in the transition plan model was something that I believed could be a win-win scenario. As we know, that didn't work out. But I appreciate June being very supportive of, of Timmy um, with his comments. And I know that they'll be meeting. And, um, you know, obviously, June supporting him is, is, is huge for our program. You know, talking about that whole process, uh, it was a very public process and something that was quite unique in this situation where it was like it was almost like a play by play of what was happening through this hiring process with uh, Coach Jones being involved. How much do you think that ultimately impacted the way things panned out so publicly uh, with, uh, you know, him speaking to the media as well as just that overall conversations of where that pro hiring process was going? Uh, how much do you think that impacted this whole entire hiring process overall? Well, I, I think we ended up where we were going to probably, you know, I, I believe that, you know, you, you have a process, you go through it. But but I do think that all the media attention that was given to June built up some unrealistic expectations, possibly for some fans thinking that he was the only viable candidate for the head coaching position. And that wasn't the case. I and mean, we, we interviewed, we had an excellent field besides Tim. We, we had six people we interviewed, very qualified candidates who I all think brought different strengths to the table, including June. Uh, and, and really, you know, the media attention, that's not June's fault. Uh, he, you know, it's just, it's kind of, you know, he was sought out, he answered questions. Uh, and he was in a position where he could, where a lot of the other candidates who are in in positions already uh, weren't, um, it, it wasn't probably to their best interest, the talk that they were applying for a job when they have a current job. 
I'm interested to know what you think the role should be of the legislature. We saw them pretty involved in the departure of the previous coach and, you know, um, some lawmakers even calling for a change in the hiring process. Do you think that there should be more involvement for the board from the Board of Regents? And, and what is that like for you having lawmakers sort of weighing in on, on your, you know, everyday decisions? Well, you know, the legislature in, re in recent past has been very supportive of a lot of our financial positions, and we appreciate that very much. Um, and we all always appreciate constrictive input on how we can improve. But be beyond that, it is, it is a little confusing. I mean, I report to the president, reports to the Board of Regents. And really, my role as athletic director is to do what's, what I believe is in the best interest of the department. And, and, I, and as long as I'm in this job, I'll do that every day. Uh, one of our mantras in the department is, you know, how can we get, you know, do, do something better each day, get 1% better each day. And, and that continues to, to be kind of our goal. You know, there are very few uh, athletic directors or football coaches that get called to appear in front of a, a Senate, uh, you know, special committee to testify and, and to speak publicly about some of the things that have happened uh, through that process of, you know, when you, that initial um, informational briefing, as they called it, was called. Uh, and, and there was that process and some of the concerns that were brought up. I mean, what has come from that hearing, I guess? I mean, ultimately, we know uh, that we now have a new head coach with this football team. But there were some other concerns that were raised during those conversations. I mean, what other things came about from, you know, the Senate informational briefing? Yeah, well, obviously, that was a challenge. Um, um, you know, what, what came from it? And it, actually, what came a lot of things came from it before. We really didn't get a chance to see a lot of the things we were doing in that because there were a lot of people who were testifying um, some of them were in the were in the locker room. Some of them weren't. Um, but you know what, what's come from the whole process, including that Senate briefing, is you know we had an action plan for Todd Graham um, that we were implementing to to get better. Um, we, we started this new communications committee. I had a couple local um, mentors working with him on a weekly basis and a monthly basis as, as much as myself. So we you know we had seven or eight points that we were really working on to improve. And and I thought that that was a viable alternative to get better. Obviously, Todd decided to resign. Um, and I'm excited with where, where we're at now. But, you know, to answer your question, obviously, it's a challenge when everything's so public uh, because we have, you know, we have FERPA, uh, HIPAA and also union contracts. So there's, you know, it, it's tough to, you know, to, to say certain things publicly. But I, but I do think, um, you know, everything's an opportunity to get better. And, and I think we've gotten better through this process. Let's talk a little bit about facilities. There's a lot of concern, of course, Aloha Stadium is not a place that you can play right now. Uh, and the uh, T.C. Ching complex uh, is where you'll be. But there have been some concern raised about re reaching um, NCAA capacity requirements to stay in the division that you're in. Can you tell us about any expansion plays or how your uh, plans or how you're going to be able to meet those requirements, given the constraints of that facility? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I mean, and I, I really look at it as two parts. Um, there's the long term uh, NACED project where that's going and as, as well as what we're doing, um, you know, I would say in, in this current method to get us uh, to bridge us there. Right now, we're, we're, we're at 9000 seats. Uh, we're planning on adding about another thousand seats uh, for this year. Um, so there's some supply chain challenges that, that we're dealing with. Um, and then we're looking at to be over 15,000 by 23. Um, obviously, the NCA has a um, uh, a criteria of 15,000. So we, we need to be over that on a two year rolling average starting this year. Uh, there are waivers that you, if, as long as you have a plan, I think there are waivers that you can um, get. Uh, I've been working with the conference on that. But, but the big thing is, is to get our, um, you know, TC Ching to over, the Clarence TC Ching complex to over 15,000 as soon as possible. I think we're thinking 23 is our target right now. Um, but, but part of what depends on, we need more information on the NACED project. When is that going to be done? Uh, because that, that factors in decisions we make too on, on how robust we make it actually here. You know, we've heard uh, on this program, in fact, uh, some former governors, including governors Abercrombie and uh, Wahe, who have been on this program talking about the future of uh, the stadium and the fact that a stadium should be permanently uh, be located on the lower campus and that Aloha Stadium should not be rebuilt. Uh, and that should be something that should be used for affordable housing. Uh, their push was really to try to find a way to implement some sort of permanent facility uh, on the lower campus. What are your thoughts on anything, uh, any plans like that or anything to turn the TC Ching complex into a more permanent uh, stadium rather than uh, a temporary one? Well, you know, I love the idea of an on-campus stadium, um, a football stadium. There's such an energy and vibe, tr uh, you know, truly playing at your home that it's really hard to duplicate elsewhere. And I can see it being feasible, but there are, are certainly some limitations to building in Manoa. 
Um, but to me, you know, the real, the real question, the more important thing is not really where it is. I mean, it, we, you know, I can see it there. I can see it in lava. It's really when it's, it's, we, we need to get, a, have a solid plan and have a timetable of when, because that will help us in so many areas, even with the NCA, even with our student athletes, where we have a target saying, this is when it's going to be done. So I think that's, that's our big target right now. Well, we've seen with public works projects everywhere and here in Hawaii, they can take a long time and there can be a lot of delays. Um, you know, of course, something like rail comes to mind. Are you concerned that this thing could take so long that you would, you know, have to ex ask for extension after extension and perhaps the NCAA would not be look so kindly on that? Yeah. Well, I, th I think we're, 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 our plan is to get to the point where, where, where we have a viable, where we won't we, we won't need to ask extensions. We meet the criteria by 23. But but I think that's a valid, you know, that's a, a valid concern. Um, obviously, um, you know, I know public works, you know, there's a challenge to them. I'm very proud of the job that we did to get Clarence T.C. Ching up in really form in, you know, about four months construction time uh, and not finding out till December 12th that we had to do it. I mean, that was a uh, yeoman's work by so many people. Uh, including some donors who gave some significant money led by the the Ching Foundation. So yeah, it's it's a concern, but that's why we have to kind of go on parallel tracks. We have to have Clarence T.C. Ching Complex ready uh, for the foreseeable future, but hopefully it won't it, it won't be as long as anticipated. You know, when we're talking about the conversation of this new Aloha Stadium, what is what has the involvement been uh, of the athletic department? Have you been in talks at all with? Uh, the developers or with those at the state level about, you know, what you would like to see in a facility. I mean, being one of the key tenants that would be utilizing that facility, you would think that there would be some influence by the athletic department. Have you guys been involved in those conversations at all? Yeah, it, it, you know, initially we were involved to, to some degree. There was still so much planning going on, so maybe not as much. But as as it's moving forward, we, we've um, uh, the stadium authority, the stadium manager, and the people doing the project, we've had more involvement with the uh, consultants, and, and I anticipate that we'll have more as time goes on. Uh, they have reached out to us to, to 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 have more involvement. Obviously, you know, a lot of this is with the RFP dates and all that. Um, so I hope now we'll be in a position to to be more involved. Uh, we obviously want to be involved, and and I think that we've been invited to to have more of a a say to 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 speak what what we feel our needs are. And a lot, frankly, very candidly, a lot of the important needs are, are really they deal with the financial model. Uh, I mean, that's that's a disadvantage we have in Hawaii that we can't monetize our football like a lot of other places. So that model is very important to us. Let's talk about fan enthusiasm and trying to fill those seats. Um, we saw that even though football was opened up to some fans, uh, you know, that it, those seats were not full in the last few games. What are you doing to, you know, excite fans and get them back on campus? And, and why do you think that was? I mean, do you think it's COVID concerns or is there something deeper about, you know, the fan loyalty and, and how do you get that excitement back so that people actually do come and buy tickets and support the team in person? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start with um, why I think it was, and then I'll, I'll get on to, you know, what, what I think we can do. Uh, there are the many reasons we were handicapped with attendance. I mean, part of it is we didn't have, couldn't have full fans until the last two games of the season, uh, uh, and that, which means we really didn't have a season ticket base due to COVID, which, which impacts your uh, attendance. We also, you know, let me tell you something. I learned one thing is if you can't drink a beer at a football game, that's, a, that's not a good thing. So we had no concessions also. Um, also, people don't realize that kids under 12 – very few of them were vaccinated at that point. So they weren't able to come to the games, which means their parents wouldn't come to the games too. So we limited our, our pool of people. And also at that point, a lot of people had bought and pay per view television, uh, the package. So they, they went down that road to watch, you know, and on top of that, you know, people were still reluctant to go to large crowds uh, amidst the pandemic. So there was concerns there. I do think a lot of these factors will go away hopefully sooner than later as we return to, I don't even say no, new normal, but beyond, beyond COVID. Uh, that said, you know, we will have to continue to work to increase fan attendance in creative manners for all of our sports. I mean, COVID-19 has impacted demand for all live events in Hawaii. Even look at our basketball and men's volleyball crowds. Um, they're down and it's, it's, it's not because there's not excitement about the program. So we, we, we have to look at ways we can excite the community. I think Coach Chang and the staff he's put together and this whole players thing about brotherhood, about supporting us, is, is excitement that people are looking for. And, and we just have to continue to, 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 to look at our price points and, to, and to, you know, to improve in marketing. But a lot of it comes down to the, the product. And I think the product's really good. And I think it's something that people will want to support, especially Coach Chang and, and, and a lot of our arena and, and you know, even baseball and softball. 
Yeah, if you're looking at the success right now of the indoor programs, uh, you know, all, all of them are doing very well and where they're at in their seasons right now. Uh, one of the thing, though, is just the overall fan experience. And we know that that has been altered because of the regulations that are required for fans to enter. Uh, you know, I, I went to the game last week, Saturday, to that um, comeback win that the uh, no. basketball team had. Uh, but there was a very long line that snaked into the parking structure uh, for fans waiting to get in because of the verification of the vaccination card and COVID testings. Uh, you know, and, and it took a while to kind of get through that process. Is there anything being done uh, to maybe help to expedite that process or conversations that help that are going, getting underway that might help the overall fan experience in that matter? Yeah, well, you know, in, in, obviously improving the fan experience is, is important. I, I, I think by and large, the majority of people that come in get in pretty quickly. It's it's at the end, pinch point at the end when everyone comes at the last minute is a problem. So we need to look operationally with our team to see how we can expand that to have more points to come in. Um, I, 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 you know, I, you talked about the uh, basketball, you know, what a great comeback. Uh, victory for the men's team. The women's team did it yesterday. I, I know Coach Chang has been at two events, and they've been great comeback wins. And he brought a lot of the football players yesterday. So, uh, I mean, which is awesome. I mean, our, you know, you know, the, our our coaches are are united right now. That's powerful. That's powerful. But yeah, but to look, we we need to continue to look at operational issues. How we can get better. I mean, you know, the you know throughout COVID, we know we've had to continually pivot and adapt and and get better. And and that's this just another thing we we need to take a look at. I want to ask you a little bit just about the COVID protocols for student athletes um, and how you've been able to combat cases and, and keep things, you know, relatively safe for, for student athletes. Can you tell us a little bit about the protocols, what kind of outbreaks you've seen and, and how you're going to be doing this going forward? Because it does feel like COVID is going to be with us for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, um, you know, the first year we had 32 cases out of 15,500 tests about, you know, so a very low positivity rate. Um, we, we have a, for the first year of COVID, uh, our medical committee, which is made up of our doctor, our head trainer, and the two associate athletic directors and myself, we met every week. Uh, now we're meeting every other week. And, and we talk about the, the protocols. You know, in, in essence, uh, you know, with Omicron coming back, we, we've had to take a step back um, since we do have some unvaccinated student athletes based on um, uh, you know, medical and religious exemptions uh, that they might have, they have some different criteria they have to go. But we've looked at obviously bringing back some testing for them, masking. Uh, but in essence, we follow the NCA state city guidelines and university guidelines. But, but what we do is it's just intentional focus. Uh, and when I say we meet every two weeks now, we're really talking on the other week about specific issues about, you know, how we can get better and how we can keep our community safe. Overall, I can't say enough. Our, our MVPs the last two years, because it will be two years I think in February, or March, wow, um, is uh, I think the the MVPs ha have been our medical staff and athletic trainers and our coaches buying in, and it's been hard. I mean, I mean, it's hard to team build when you can't get together, when we don't let them eat together, when when we can't have these balloon fights and these other things that you know that you do to blow off steam. Uh, so hopefully, we'll get back to more of that. I am optimistic though that we're we're headed in a better direction and and we're going to learn to live with COVID going forward. In, 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 a, in a manner that I think um, can bring back some of the important things that impact our lives, our daily lives. In just sticking with this overall procedures and these protocols that you set into place, um, what does that specifically look like? If, if there is a player that tests positive, are, are they isolated? Um, are they you know, taken off the team? I mean, we've seen instances with the basketball team that they've had to um, you know, cancel a few games. We saw a few men's volleyball players be held out of competition. What does that overall protocol entail and how large is that circle within the team bubble? Yeah, well, well, when someone tests positive, they, they they do go into isolation. We we look at their close contacts. We test them appropriately. Uh, the, it used to be like a ten day, and now it's like a, a five day. And there's a way to test out of it. So the the protocols have changed based on CDC and the city. Uh, but but I mean, when in doubt, um, we're conservative, um, and uh, you know, because we we don't want to spread. And obviously, a lot of these are young, healthy um, men and women, so they haven't gotten too sick. But, you know, but 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 some people have you know struggled with COVID. So bottom line is we take a conservative approach. They go in isolation. Uh, we, we test them. Obviously, uh, the group that they've been close to, we, we monitor them and, and see if there's a reason why they need to uh, test first before they can return. 
I want to get some of your thoughts sort of on some big changes that have been happening with student athletes in the last year. And that, of course, is student athletes being able to be in control of their name, uh, image and likeness, NIL, if you will. And uh, what plans UH Manoa has to help student athletes leverage that ability now? We see other schools uh, on the continent really helping those student athletes bring in sizable sums of money. Is that something that the university is looking at? And because obviously for a student athlete that's deciding between where to commit, that could be a draw. If you go to school X, they'll help you make this much money. How, how do you compete in that, in that way? Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, first of all, that the changes have been in the last few years with uh, NIL coupled with the transfer portal now and the new rules where you don't have to sit out and you can even go transfer within the conference have been, huge, you know, huge changes that are, are influencing the landscape. And, and obviously, you know, that's impacting. So we, we have to be strategic. The, the thing is, though, NIL is not supposed to be a recruiting advantage. Uh, and now, now I'm not naive in saying that people aren't using it for that way, but it's not supposed to be paid for play. And some of those schools that are doing it in that manner are being looked at, they're, they're being evaluated by the NCA right now. So I but I do think, um, you know, we, we, we have to figure it out, we have to look at How's a way that it's appropriate for University of Hawaii? We have our guidelines. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for student athletes. I also think um, I, I think it's good for them to learn about business as they do it. I think there's also some concerns. Good thing about Hawaii, most people are fair brokers and and really have good, good intentions at heart. There there are some there are some contracts out there for these kids that are pretty much locking them up in perpetuity. Um, you know, so if they have a professional, so so there are some downside to that. So we they, we really need to make sure they have quality representation. But it's 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 not us doing the deals. I mean, that's that's even and, and most schools are not. Um, but so I think we got to continue to um, to um, look at how we can play the best role to be productive in that to help ourselves. But, you know, in the, in the end, NIL um, is one component. You know, um, there's a lot of other things about Hawaii that gives us a competitive advantage about why Hawaii. When I meet with recruits, you know what I tell them, what I tell every recruit and the coaches, they, they, they they've heard this so many times that I tell them. The special thing about playing at the University of Hawaii is that you're not just playing for your team, the university, you're playing for the whole state. And, 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 and that's unique about Hawaii. And I say that's an incredible opportunity, but it's also a responsibility that they need to steward well because they have the opportunity to inspire the next generation. A kid who maybe doesn't like school too much to say, hey, I'm going to be the first person in my family to go to college so I can be a rainbow wahine or rainbow warrior. And, and, you know, and, and that that's special. That's special. Um, and just, you know, the, the people of Hawaii, I mean, what I tell people is, hey, you know, it's a great thing when everybody cares. You know, so many people care. It's also a little challenging thing that I've learned, too. You know, we talked a little bit about the facilities and what's happening uh, on the lower campus. Is there any other projects that are currently being worked on within the athletic department? Because we know that that has been such a, a vocal point in so many, uh, you know, of the conversations that have been moving forward about how do we stay competitive yeah. uh, as a school and as a, com you know, a as a athletic department uh, when competing against some of the best. What are some of the other projects that are happening there on the yeah. lower campus? Well, you know, you know, I, I think there's a misconception about, you know, in the last five years, we've got gym one and gym two are arguably some of the best practice gyms in, in, in on the West Coast, maybe in the country. New locker rooms for some of the arena sports, the bath, um, the baseball um, locker room, the, the softball stadium. Go check it out. We're going to have a christening of, of all the work that's been done there. Um, but um, there's always more work to do. I think the one thing that we we need to focus on grand, in a grandiose manner is a football performance center that can open up spaces for some of our other sports too. But right now we're working on the um, obviously um, Ching Field, but uh, but the strength and conditioning room. We, we we received some money from the legislature, which we're very appreciative for. I just I saw the final design and plan yesterday, so we're going to start that project uh, very shortly now. Which uh, unfortunately we can't increase our footprint where it's at the stand share center because it's not safe but we're able to kind of make it more efficient get new equipment in there new flooring um have a nutrition station there too uh, very excited about that i i have a, a picture the next project we always do i have a picture in my office i walk in every day and i have to look at it so i have to then i have to work to try to fund it and we're, we're appreciative of the legislature and and the office of project delivery on campus who's um you know who will start that project very shortly so it, it, i'm excited about that 
You know, we are almost out of time, but I want to ask you a little bit just in something that you referred to with this idea that you play for the whole state. And in your role as AD, um, you know, you get criticism from the whole state and, uh, you know, thumbs up when you do well. And uh, when people think you're not doing well, then then you hear it, you know, in the editorial pages or wherever. I, I hope that you're not reading all the Facebook comments that come in everywhere. Not here, but but in general. I mean, I would think that the last few weeks have probably been pretty trying. Uh, tell us a little bit about what that whole process has been like for you personally and how you turn the page, uh, given, you know, how tough I imagine it has been. Yeah, well, I appreciate the question. And, um, you know, I've, I've learned uh, through coaching that uh, vulnerability is a strength. I mean, it's, it's been hard. Um, uh, I, I can look, you know, I can tell everyone that I do what I believe is best. I learn from it. Um, there have been some... Uh, you know, I try to stay away from social media. People give me a flavor of what's going on. Um, I also, you know, I've received some emails that were, um, you know, um, not very kind to my family or myself. And that's, 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 you know, that's um, tough to deal with. But, you know, in the end, um, you know, I'm thankful that, the, that people care. And, 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 I, and I, have to, I have to continue to process that in a healthy manner. Uh, the good thing about this is going through this is a great opportunity for me to uh, say, how can I change to get better? You know, part of it is I know I need to sleep more. I need to exercise more. And I really need to be going from the COO because I'm an operator, man. I love operating, but I got great staff here who've done a phenomenal job. The last month, I haven't been able to deal much on the operations. My staff has had to do it. And guess what? They've done great. So I got to go from that COO role to the CEO role and, and be more strategic. And um, I've, I've told my executive team that they have to hold me accountable for that. And, uh, and I'm going to even get some coaching on that. So everything's an opportunity, and and I, I'm excited about that. But yeah, it, it's been tough. Um, I, I'm 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 blessed with an incredible wife and family uh, who are strong and uh, supportive, and um, and a lot of great friends uh, from across the country and and right here in Hawaii. So just gotta you know just keep going forward and 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 realize that um, you know the goal is is to um, get better and 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 to and to work at um, healing from some of the hurt in a productive manner. You know, not to beat on this too much, but you know, there have even been call, calls for your resignation by some fans. I mean, how, how do you deal and manage with that? I mean, with those types of comments and that level of criticism, obviously the, a lot of it's stemming from just the way that the entire uh, coaching hire situation unfolded. Uh, looking back, is there anything that you would have changed at all? And, and, and with, you know, that whole process and, and how do you deal with some of those types of um, specific calls for you to resign? You know, you know, I, I think you gotta, you know, look at the, you know, I, I addressed a lot of this in, in my, um, in my press conference about, you know, the, the process, you know, that um, a, a lot of people thought that, you know, what was it a fair deal? So I, I'll address that right now. You know, um, the offer was sincere for June. There, there were a lot of benefits that I could see in the transition concept. So I thought it was a great opportunity that, you know, we could just get this historic duel from Coach Jones and, and Timmy, you know, as the next coach. Um, the original June meeting was scheduled for three hours. It, unfortunately, we only went for 30 minutes. And we went from two years to three years on that. Uh, and frankly, the the idea came from June back in 2015 with Rolo about a, a coach in waiting plan. Uh, but, you know, as, as we, you know, so that was the, you know, I was hopeful. I, I probably was trying to thread a needle and, and it didn't, I know it didn't work out, but the, the intentions were really, you know, and I think I got caught up in what the possibilities were. I respect June's decision and not accept, uh, you know, accepting it, but I, you know, it was, it, it, I, I was excited about it. And I guess I was wrong that it didn't work out. Um, as far as the calls for resignation, um, you know, I, 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 I serve, you know, our student athletes and, and I'm, I'm planning to do the best job I can for them. Uh, these jobs don't last forever. Um, there's David Matlin, the athletic director, and then there's David Matlin, uh, who's not the athletic director. Uh, but, um, you know, I can't get caught up in all that um, because, you know, I, you can't get caught up in some of the positive stuff too, you know, because then you start believing your own hype. So you got to be measured on that. But at the end of the day, my job is, the, is to serve our student athletes, our staff, you know, and, and our state. And um, I'm thankful that a lot of people care, but it's challenging at times. Well, final question before we let you go, uh, just how do we best support the team? You know, now we're moving, like like I said, we're turning the page on this. Uh, I see it in the comments here. A lot of people writing, you know, TC is our coach. They want to get behind him. What are you hearing from the community and, and what are you asking for when it comes to the football program? 
Yeah, well, uh, I think, um, you know, in the football context there is, is supporting Timmy. Uh, he, I think he's doing so many good things. Uh, we, we need uh, moral support. We need ideas. We need money. Uh, uh, a lot of ways to support NACOA. But it's also what, what Timmy's doing is all of our coaches are getting unified right now. So it's supporting the, all of our athletes. I mean, I mean, we have to, you know, be, con be concerned about all approximately 500 athletes and how we can better do a good job. So I, th I think the big thing is, um, you know, um, support the home team and uh and 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 and, and i think timmy is uh, we're going to be proud of of the way he represents our, our our university and our state well he's already proven to be as you mentioned that good luck charm and coach <laughs> uh, with those two comeback wins with the basketball team coach beam coach beeman uh, spoke very highly of him and, and was very thankful that he was there last night as well uh, so he could be that good luck charm that we just need him to go to every single UH sporting event moving forward. Uh, so actually, just talking to Coach Beeman about that. She said he needs to keep coming. <laughs> yeah, <sir. laughs> well, we thank you so much, Dave Matlin, for spending your little Friday with us and giving us, giving us an update on the happenings at the uh, on the athletic campus. So thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate the Aloha. opportunity. Aloha. Great to get an update from UH Manoa on all the happenings. Uh, and very interesting, Ryan, to hear about uh, how it sounds like we're going to have football on campus for the foreseeable future. You know, we can't wait for Aloha Stadium, obviously, and they're going to try to get that facility up to speed and up to the NCAA requirements for uh, capacity so that that can be a semi-permanent place to play until Aloha Stadium is ready. And there really is no timeline for that just yet. Yeah, and you know, as he said, they could be looking for a waiver from the NCAA to grant them the ability to keep playing in the facility they are with the plans to expand it to the capacity level of 15,000, which would make that acceptable uh, and moving forward, uh, playing into in that complex and for the foreseeable future until uh, that new Aloha Stadium is complete and ready, which we know could take some time as uh, you know, there continues to be some back and forth happening right now, in fact, in the legislature about how to move forward with that facility and that entire complex. We also heard uh, more about just the overall process in you know, hiring of Coach Timmy Chang uh, and his thoughts, again, moving forward into this future with Coach Chang, but also recognizing that there were still a lot of individuals in the community who were upset with the process. Uh, but Dave Matlin, very confident in this new coach moving forward, saying that he's brought a new energy to the campus. Uh, we've seen it uh, you know, through the other teams and the excitement that he's brought thus far. Uh, but, you know, Dave Matlin really looking to the future uh, of this football program now that Timmy Chang has had about a few weeks to settle into this new role. Yeah, and very interesting also to hear his personal reflection on how this process has really changed him, saying that it was hurtful at times, but that he's recognized throughout this process that he really needs to change his leadership style from the COO, because he was an operations guy for so long, to becoming more of a CEO and taking more of that role, and that that's something that he's going to work on personally as he uh, as he moves forward. Uh, good to hear about all the successes that all of the teams are having. If anyone knows that, of course, that is you. <laughs> <laughs> um, because we know that you're in the, in those arenas day in and day out and, and just wonderful to see UH Athletics doing so well. And great to see the fans also coming back. They're slowly beginning to, uh, I think, maybe feel a little more comfortable attending some of these games. We saw bigger crowds for basketball uh, last weekend and men's volleyball continues to pull in some crowds as well. And as those regulations drops, I think the hope by the athletic department is that more fans will begin making their way down to support the home team. So uh, all in all, it's a great season right now going on for a lot of the teams there. So we hope that people go out there and support the Bulls. Uh, moving forward, we are looking forward to our conversations next week, including uh, catching up with Governor Ige. That's right. We'll be talking to him on Monday. He's just coming back from a trip to Washington, D.C., where he met with a roundtable of other governors. Uh, we'll be interested to hear his thoughts on the COVID case counts, hospital pressures, and what he's learning from some of his, uh, you know, uh, counterparts in other states in terms of COVID-19 management. Uh, on Wednesday, we'll be speaking to Congressman Kai Kahele. We know a lot of you have questions for him about perhaps his political ambitions. Uh, there's been a lot of buzz around that, so we'll be talking to him on Wednesday, another full week of Spotlight Hawaii. Make sure to tune in right here, 1030 with the governor on Monday. Have a great weekend. We'll see you then. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs and Beachside Roofing.